Hi there, this is Aaron. Well, this is video number four in the series when we've been looking at things that I've learned through making these videos and sharing it with you. Uh, I must stress that I don't consider myself an expert. I'm not a professional. I just feel that I've learned a few things and so I think it's fair to share that with anybody else that uh, might find it useful. Today what I want to look at is film how I film, how I set things up, cameras, the equipment and the techniques. Now the first thing I want to show you is this. This is a Canon Moto Zoom 8EEE. -E -E. Now this is one of the early cine cameras and this one was actually my grandfather's. And I remember as a child you know, seeing him point this at anything that moved, including me, and then he would sit down, he had a full um, you know, little clipping uh, set up that you would actually physically clip the film and then splice it together, and then we would watch the films that he made on the projector. Now it doesn't record sound, but uh, it, it does record in colour. This is actually um, quite an advanced model, it was released in 1962, and it contained a lot of features that went on to become seen in you know, much, much later cameras. So it was quite an advanced camera for the time, and he certainly knew his stuff. The point is that seeing this around is what really inspired me to start making these videos. I can remember my grandfather sitting there creating a film, and you know, this is now the modern day equivalent of that brought right up to date. In many ways I wish that he could see it because I'm sure that he would love this world of YouTube and digital photography. <laughs> Just as my grandfather inspired me to uh, become a gardener, it's also him that inspired me to start filming these as well. Well, probably like most people, when I first started making YouTube videos, the first thing that I used was my phone, and this is my iPhone. Now, I look at my early videos, the first couple, and I made every mistake in the book. For a start, I was holding it portrait, and of course the first tip you learn with any YouTube video using your phone is that you always record it in landscape, because then the picture will fill the space inside YouTube. So uh, I started using that and uh, just pointing my camera down, and from that I was able to get a real start on things. Uh, I look back at it now and I think my camera skills were about as good as my gardening skills and they were really bad. So <laughs> everyone had to start somewhere and I was really happy to start with this. The temptation with a phone is that you're always pointing it down and that you're looking down into it and the best camera angle is actually just slightly above head height. So that's why these things can uh, become quite useful. This is a selfie stick. And it's quite literally a stick with a cradle that you put the phone on. If I step back, you can see then I can start to get a decent angle. And uh, from there, I can actually create something that looks a little bit more professional. Now you have got all the wobble and uh, you, you, you need a very, very steady hand. But this is really the first stage into starting to get something that looks a little bit better and is a little bit more pleasant to use. The real difference for me happened when I started using this, which is my iPad. Now, iPads have two cameras, as do most phones. This particular one, the two cameras are in two different resolutions. It took me ages to figure this out. So that when I'm looking through the viewfinder to the camera pointing at a subject, it's recording in 720 by 1080. Whereas if I look straight into the camera, so I'm filming myself, uh, it's at a lower resolution and it's not HD. And uh, I couldn't work out why the the frames were different sizes um, and eventually discovered that. So if you're starting to get results that you think, I'm not quite sure how this is happening, that might be the reason. So look at the specifications of the camera on your phone or on your iPad. Now to show how adaptable this is, this was actually the 
like it that I think really enabled me to take better photographs because of this. Now this is a cradle and the cradle fits around the iPad very snugly. On the back of the cradle is a screw thread where you can fit any tripod fitting. So I've just fitted my Valbon tripod fitting to this. And that means I can first of all seat it inside. I can turn it up and now what I'm doing is that I've got a camera mount that is perfect for setting up my shots. And this is how I made YouTube videos for over a year, right up until spring this year. And I was really, really pleased with the results because it frees me up, I can walk away from the camera and it's level, it's steady, and I can take much better shots. I was filming in 720, which is HD and that's perfectly fine. I wanted to see though what it would look like as I moved on to my new plot and things started to come alive if I was able to shoot in a higher resolution. And so possibly because this was inspired by my grandfather, uh, I, I wanted to see what things would be like if I used uh, a camera instead of just an iPad so that I could get a higher resolution because there were more pretty things around me and I wanted to be able to record them as the best that I could. I'd never owned a video camera before and so I knew that I needed to do an awful lot of research and there was about eight weeks of research that I did looking at different cameras. And what I found is that there are different categories of camera and the whole thing has been confused because everybody wants a piece of the YouTube video making action and so everybody claims that their camera is perfect for making YouTube videos. I think that there is a camera that is suited to the way that each individual wants to make YouTube videos. And so it's a case of working out what your knowledge is, what your skills are, and then matching that to what you want to film, and then from that being able to choose a camera. Cameras fall into different categories. At one end you've got the camcorders, and then you've got um, point and shoot cameras that have grown up to become video cameras. At the other end of the scale you've got DSLR cameras and then even on from that you've got professional film making cameras. Now they can go up to £10,000 and so I, I didn't look at those too closely at all. Uh, there's something in the middle which is called a mirrorless camera and they're similar to DSLR cameras uh, but the physics and the, uh, the actual technology behind them is different. So I had a choice really of four, of camcorders, point and click, then the mirrorless and the DSLR cameras. And if I start with the DSLR cameras, because there's absolutely no question that the quality of picture that you get uh, from video in high-end DSLR cameras is amazing. In order to get the brilliant results, you need to know how to use a DSLR camera. I've never even owned a 35 millimeter uh, SLR camera. So for me that was going to mean that there was a huge learning curve. The other thing that I learned about DSLR cameras is that the sound quality, I mean they, they've grown up from cameras that were taking still shots. So now they can take video but there has never been a decent sound system designed for these and so quite often the sound quality that was going to be in a DSLR was going to be inferior to some of the other cameras. The main thing about DSLRs though is that the learning curve for me to be able to take good pictures was going to be too long. Now of course DSLRs do have that button that says automatic and it'll work everything out for you. But if you're going to just use the automatic setting, then you're kind of wasting everything that a DSLR is all about. Now the other thing of course is that I work alone. There's, there's nobody standing behind that camera now. This is just me on my plot. So what I was gonna do was gonna have to set the shot up each time 
walk round. Now, you need to be a much better cameraman than I am uh, to be able to do that. So I discounted the DSLR cameras and I also discounted the mirrorless cameras that are, you know, have the similar issues as DSLR cameras. So I, I put those right to the side. What I was left with was the point and click cameras. Now, the current darling of you know, some of the, the more well-known bloggers seems to be the G7X, and I know that Sean uses that camera as well, and I think that Tony uses that camera as well. And so when you see the incredible depth of field that you get, I believe that they are using that camera. They're quite small. I don't have one here, but I'll put a picture up. Uh, they're, they're quite small cameras, they're compact, they're lightweight, so that they fit very well onto a tripod, but you can also carry them around. And that's why I say a lot of the more well-known bloggers uh, carry them around because you can put one on a selfie stick and it's not an absolute ton weight. So that's really good. Now for me, weight isn't really an issue because I've mounted everything on top of a tripod I'm working alone I'm not carrying it with me so being able to balance it on the end of a selfie stick really isn't an issue so that wasn't part of my deciding criteria for me I need everything set to auto so even though I probably could get into photography through a point-and-click camera it wasn't going to be used to its fullest by me making these videos. So finally what I came to was camcorders. Camcorders have always been created with the idea of video and sound marrying up and so typically the sound inside a camcorder is certainly better than it is inside an SLR. So what I was looking for was a camera that could film at least in 1920 by 1080 and ideally in what's being called Full HD. A few years ago, cameras that were shooting in 1080 uh, by 1920 would record at 30 frames per second, whereas now it's possible to record at 50 and 60, depending on the codec. And the codec is how the image is being encrypted and then written to a file. As I went through, I started to learn about something called 4K. Now, 4K is the next generation of picture quality. And most people that record and upload 4K onto YouTube, um, it's not actually going to be viewed in 4K because most people's bandwidth can't cope with it at the moment. But it is the future. And so I was also looking at something that was going to be able to cope with 4K. So what I came up with is the camera that um, I'm, I'm using now, and obviously I can't film me and tell you about it at the same time. So here's a picture of it, which is the Sony FDR AXP 33. So what this camera does is it shoots in 1920 by 1080, but it does so at 50 frames per second, which means that you get that much crisper image. I know that Dave remarked once when I started using this camera that it almost has looked as if I'd use a green screen and I was superimposing myself onto the background. And that's because of the, uh, the, the, the much higher frame rate that is creating a crisper picture. I'm talking to you behind the camera now and I'm trying to frame up a shot here and hopefully what you can see is that I've pointed the camera so that I've got a very level horizon and that's what I find is one of the, the, the keys to creating a good quality image. If I just pull that down now. So then as I walk into the shot you can see that uh, hopefully that you know it looks reasonably well framed. We've got uh, a nice horizon going across the top and it's very clear hopefully that the subject is me as, as I'm talking to you. So these are things that I've learned as I'm using the camera. The other thing, and this is the main thing that made me choose this camera as opposed to any others, and that is because the lens on this is actually set inside a gyroscope and if I walk around with the lens the gyroscope corrects each shutter and it's, it's almost the same as having a steady cam. Now on this particular model, the quality of the steady shot technology is as good as professional quality. And because my plot is on a slope, I thought that that was gonna be really important so that I could take as good quality images as I possibly could.
Let me show you. I'm holding the camera now with the uh, steady shot technology and I'm just panning round and I'm also walking uphill and this is quite steep. It's also very uneven. As I walk up my plot, which you see is an absolute mess. But what the technology is doing is trying to smooth out everything that is happening as I walk along. And I must admit, I don't have a particularly steady hand here. So if this is anything other than juddering around, then the technology has worked. And that's where we've just walked up. And so this is me standing behind the camera and this is how I do things. That I set the shot up like this. Have I got a straight horizon? Yes, I do. I've got my sound working. And so then I come round to the front and this is how I deliver the scene. <laughs> Well, the reason I'm making these videos is because ever since I started to upgrade and use different techniques and you know, discover the techniques, I didn't invent these. I found these out from people that are much more clever than I am. But the reason for the films is so that I can share with you what I've learned. So if that was useful, then this has certainly been worthwhile. What I want to do next time is to put it all together. So we've taken the video, We've recorded the sound, we've cleaned the sound up in post-production, and now what's left is to put it all together into a video editing package. So I hope that's useful for you, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.